Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel L. Conan, and I have Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson on the line. He is Chief Investment Officer of Lemelson Capital Management. He's joined us on the show a few times, discussing the markets and his picks. Reverend, how are you doing today? Good. Thank you, Joel. It's such a pleasure to be with you again. Okay, well, before we get into the stock market, uh, you've been pretty busy over the last month or so, and uh, you had a visit with the Pope. A uh, couple questions here. First of all, how do you get invited to visit the Pope? And second of all, what do you talk about? Well, uh, you know, I was really blessed, Joel, um, to be permitted to be part of the Orthodox delegation that met... Uh, so this really historic meeting between uh, His All Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew, who is the spiritual leader of about 300 million Orthodox Christians, and uh, His All Holiness Pope, uh, Pope Francis. And um, I really have my, my bishop to thank for that, uh, His Eminence Metropolitan El Tigo Foros, um, who is uh, an extraordinary leader, and uh, he extended that invitation, and uh, it was just a blessing and a privilege to be there. Uh, you know, as a young man, I, I, I received a Jesuit education in my mentor was a Catholic priest, actually. Uh, he was almost like a father figure, to tell you the truth. And um, as a young man, you know, I harbored these, these visions that somehow the church would be uh, reunited with this deep wound that divided East and West would somehow be healed. And as I got older, you know, I think I lost sight of that somewhat. I thought probably not ever in my lifetime. But when I was there, uh, just a few feet with my son, uh, when these two great world leaders met, and they really met out of a true love, uh, and, and respect for one another. I love the friendship. And to see them embrace and to see the Pope um, ask for the blessing of the Patriarch uh, as the Bishop of Rome, uh, it was just a really once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I, I was tremendously humbled to be there and to be a part of it. And um, I just never thought I'd see such a thing in my lifetime. So really, I mean, if, if I died tomorrow, I'd die much more mean, much more satisfied and and having seen uh, something truly extraordinary. I mean, this is a schism that's divided the church for almost a thousand years, and it's just truly remarkable. Sounds uh, like... We're really fortunate to have such leaders. Yeah, sounds like an exciting thing to be part of. So, I mean, so did you have any direct conversations with them, or were you just part of a larger gathering? You know, um, there was probably 100 or 200 people there in the, the chapel of St. George there in Constantinople. Um, but I was really, again, very fortunate and very blessed to be permitted to be in the altar with uh, Patriarch Bartholomew during the Divine Liturgy on November 30th. Um, I did not uh, make any attempt or, or request to speak directly with the Pope. I was completely satisfied just being there. Um, and, and really, the beauty of the Holy Mysteries of the Church, I mean, there's not much more you can you know, be said than to just be present there at that moment. Uh, you know, we say in the Orthodox Church that in the, in the Holy Altar, that God is present. Um, it's not someplace where we talk very much, and, uh, you know, it's really the sort of just the movement of the Holy Spirit there. So that, that was enough, just being present. So uh, he wasn't looking for any stock recommendations? <laughs> uh, he didn't ask yet for any, but uh, he asked, so I'll, um, I won't be shy in giving my opinions. <laughs> okay, well, wild week in the markets uh, last week, and... Uh, We'll just move on. We'll talk about uh, some of your current positions, uh, some that uh, you have a smaller stake in than others, some you've been adding to. But uh, we haven't talked about Apple yet on the show today here. So I know you, you've had a large position in it, uh, been very, uh, very, uh, very bullish and been holding on to it. Did, uh, did they shake you out of any of your shares last week? No, no, not at all, Joel. Uh, I mean, I think two shows ago you had asked uh, about Apple when it was around 90, and I, I said, look, I wish we could buy more. And um, it then went to around almost 120, and it was almost 119. Uh, and it pulled back a little bit. That's normal. I mean, nothing goes up in a straight line. You know, when you think about a stock and whether or not you should hold it longer, I think the key thing is to sit back and ask um, yourself, uh, you know, is this thing overpriced, or do I have a better place to allocate the capital? And when you have very large companies, usually they're run better. I mean, they have superior management. And... Uh, that certainly is the case for Apple. So it's safe in that respect, and they have an extraordinary moat around their business. I mean, there's very few brands that have greater loyalty, customer loyalty, than Apple does. And when you look at Ford P&E, not even X cash, it's very difficult to call it expensive. And people, the counter argument to that is, well, there's an economy of scale that 
a company can only grow so much, and that's true. But if you look at other large companies like Google or Microsoft and so forth, Apple, again, still looks cheap. But more importantly, on a qualitative assessment, you would say, what's the alternative? I mean, they don't have the breadth, perhaps, of all the Android devices combined. But what they do have is growing. <clears throat> and their customers are really, really locked in. I mean, if you're an Apple product user, you would say to yourself, well, if I didn't have my iPad or my, my uh, MacBook Air or something, what would I use? And, the, and there's just a blank pause after that. You can hear crickets. I mean, really, Apple customers don't change. And there's, there's no foreseeable problems in the future with Apple in that sense. So it looks a lot like Microsoft did and it's, um, you know, in the 90s, for example. But if you look at my, you know, Apple today, despite having reached you know, an all-time new high market cap, it's nowhere near the multiples that Cisco or Microsoft was in, you know, during the dot-com or the tech bubble. And it's certainly not a bubble stock. So you've got a well-run large company <clears throat> producing enormous amounts of free cash flow, paying a very healthy dividend, not expensive. Um, I'm not sure what the rationale would be to sell. And, and it's important to keep in mind, too, that it's the idea of a wise investment policy is to generate wealth um, and to multiply what you have. Usually that's done through less activity, actually. I mean, there's really Good point. there's a whole panoply of studies out there that show that the greater the activity, you know, the more impaired returns are. And I think that's 100% true. So, uh, you know, I would say if you're, you know, Apple's probably fairly priced uh, above 150 a share at least. So. Okay, good point there. And you, there. and you mentioned that you know you mentioned the word uh, you know the large moat and uh, you know that uh, you know that term uh, when we had um, our our uh, analyst from Morningstar on used that term as well. So it's something our our listeners should be familiar with. Uh, let's let's move on to WWE here and sure. uh, that stock you know had a nice run up after you did the reversal kind of coming back down to earth. I know Barron's was bragging about it over the weekend, how, you know, it was one of their good calls on the short side. I know you, you caught it on the short side. Pretty uh, pretty substantial sell-off here, really, since uh, since middle of October. And considering what the market's done, the Ebola lows, uh, we've sold off from 1468 uh, down under the $11 level, now starting to climb back. Uh, you still uh, yeah. firm in your convictions on WWE? Yeah, absolutely, Joel. And, uh, and regrettably, I haven't had a chance to see the Barron's article. I'll look it up after the interview, but... Um, as, a, as mentioned on the last show, um, we increased our position in WWE, and WWE is really a special situation. So it's uh, not a no-brainer. It's not for everybody. Our thesis has been consistent all along, which is that the underlying value is tremendous. I mean, if there is a company that has more brand loyalty than Apple, it actually might be WWE. I mean, their fans are fanatics. And uh, the position that we've had all along is, again, this underlying traditional content production company. They're producing intellectual property and they're licensing it, but they own the intellectual property. They own an enormous library. And what happened in the last year is you have this OTT network, which it's been like a pendulum swinging. I mean, first, people got extraordinarily optimistic about it, too optimistic. And the, the key problem with it was that um, WWE was going through an identity crisis and perhaps is still in one under the current leadership. And that is that they believe that they can get these extraordinary multiples because they're perhaps creating new technology or entering into a new paradigm shift like a Netflix or something like that. But that's not really what the core uh, engine of the company does. The core engine of the company produces unique intellectual property for which they have no competitor. Not really. I mean, maybe the MMA franchise is a competitor, but not quite. Um, one being real fighting sport and the other one simply being theatrical. But if this company, under new leadership, returns to its core business and gets away from this idea they're going to diversify into game-changing or paradigm-shifting technologies, uh, you've got an, a pearl of great price and it can unlock enormous value. And if the leadership were to change its approach, its strategy from one, which in the recent past was of competition uh, with its key partners, you know, the networks, to one of collaboration, <clears throat> you know, again, enormous value. So the pendulum swung. So you had to be overly optimistic about the OTT network. There was evidence, if you knew anything about the leadership, that they were probably not going to deliver hence the short thesis. And now you've got an overreaction where people are saying, okay, the OTT network didn't work. Therefore, the company is worth nothing, essentially. <clears throat> also an overreaction. The company is worth quite a lot under the right fiscal leadership. This man's in it's 70 now. He really, I mean, it, it's just a biological fact. You can't do this forever. I mean, you don't have to have a crystal ball to see that there has to be some sort of succession plan, which is getting probably gaining momentum. 
it, it doesn't appear to be the next generation in the McMahon family. <clears throat> so it's reasonable to deduce from that that they're exploring a sale of the company or bringing in new leadership. Um, probably the McMahon family will always be involved creatively. I don't see that changing and probably should remain that way. But, you know, what, if and when there's a significant change in the leadership of that company, I think there's the potential for the unlocking of tremendous value uh, because you have a long list franchise, again, an extraordinary mode. And if you look at, you know, this year, uh, it's a bad year financially. We said back in March they're going to lose probably $50 million. That turned out to be about accurate. We said they'd miss their OTT some numbers. That turned out to be accurate. Under George Barrios, the company's consistently lost money for the last three or four years, <clears throat> free cash flow, EPS, all in big trouble. Now they're sort of going back to this meaning of, well, our social media <laughs> numbers look really good. Uh, that's great. I mean, social media has a place. It's really important. But that's not how you make your money. I mean, this company makes their money from producing intellectual property. They need to get back to that. And um, and then great value can be unlocked. Are you trying to get, uh, you know, more of an activist role, a, you know, a board? I mean, do you, do you do like the Carl Icahn push or the Ackman push to get involved? Um, I don't think it's really necessary, that's the truth, Joel. I think these, these changes are going to happen on their own. Okay. Um, okay. Let's move yeah, on. Whenever you have a company that's stumbling, it's, it's inevitable. And, and, and again, leadership, which is getting up there in age. I mean, you don't have to push too much. I mean, there's already been, I think, a, a great deal of light shed on the company from our reports and the constant media attention. We've reached out to the company a few times. And, uh, you know, I think these things are going to happen very naturally. It's not going to take a lot. Okay, let's move on to another one of your holdings, uh, Kulik and Sofa. Kind of just been yeah. hanging out around the $14 level. You did have some weakness last week with the sell-off, uh, back bouncing around the $14 level. Nice run off the uh, Ebola lows. Ran in trouble of fourteen fifty. dollars uh, You still comfortable with your position in this issue? Yeah, absolutely, Joel. Um, you know, we we, held, we started buying tools and sold almost two years ago in January 2013, and around $10 a share. So it's been a very good return. Uh, the company's cash position is enormous. They have this buyback, which they've been executing. Um, you know, we're, we're probably six months out from them delivering uh, their latest packaging technology, which is a high-end machine. You're talking about a, a market opportunity um, or a total addressable market of a few billion dollars for a relatively small company. I think they're going to be a leader. They, they have enormous install base for their existing machine and the wire bonding technology, which has a great breadth of application in LED technology. What kind of machine did so, you say? What kind of yeah. machine? Oh, wire bonding. Uh, they're, they're traditional wire bonding machines for okay. Uh, okay. both wafers. Yeah. So uh, in, enormous install base. Well, what should happen to the management team? I think it scares investors a little bit and confuses them because their CEO keeps selling shares. But interestingly enough, I don't think it's because he doesn't believe in the company or sees problems. I think he, he just is trying to meet his own understanding of what he thinks de risking his financial profile looks like. And it's nothing more complicated than that. And, and that's what I've you know, gleaned in my conversations with management there. And that's what we put in our letter to Bruno Gilmart when we really pushed for the share repurchase okay. um, back okay. in April, which they acquiesced to and they, they issued the share repurchase. But we walked away just saying these guys just don't know how to value the security. They don't know what they've got. That happens all the time. I mean, this guy is paid to be a professional operator and a manager, not to be an investor. So that, that you know, error can be forgiven. Um, you know, once they start delivering these and flip chip uh, patching technology machines, you're going to see a reduction uh, in R&D expense uh, because the way it's accounted for right now is going to gap. It's overstating expenses. So I'm not sure every manager in the world figured that out yet, but when they do, uh, you've got a very profitable company in your hands with a lot of free cash flow and, and, uh, and a war chest, basically. So, okay, mo that. moving right on here, uh, one that uh, you might have been taking a little bit of heat on. I know that before they released earnings last time, you were talking about Geospace uh, Tech Corp, and I believe it was trading around the $32, $33 level. Kind of hit sure. the street with a bombshell here. A big decline, 30 didn't hold, went all the way down. Under twenty six dollars, found a home at the twenty four dollar level. I see one, two, three, four lows between twenty four oh seven and twenty four thirty. Built a little bit of a foundation there. A nice rally with the market back up to the thirty dollar level. Uh, what's your short term and outlook? Short term and long term <laughs> outlook for geospace? Sure, Joel. Uh, you know it wasn't that much fun watching it go down, obviously, but. 
One thing I, I, I lamented, I didn't mention on our last interview because you asked me about Geos, is I meant to say to you that it wasn't outside of the realm of possibility the company would lose money uh, on a quarterly basis. And, I, and I, I meant to share that with you because of my conversations with the management team over there. And um, they didn't sit come out and say, you know, we're going to lose money. They can't say that. But, you know, that management team is extremely honest and they're very down to earth and they're very shareholder oriented. They've been together for a long time. And we just came out and asked them and said, look, you know, you guys, even at the bottom of the financial trough in 2009, you guys didn't lose money. So could you lose money? I mean, we understand the situation in oil is really bad. And they said, look, uh, people are saying they haven't seen oil in this bad of shape in their lifetime. And it's possible. Of course it's possible. We took that to mean they're probably going to have a loss. So we bought the stock knowing that. You know, keep in mind, you know, as Warren Buffett says, a quarter doesn't constitute a trend. And when the stock dipped, we bought more. I mean, we were buying 27 in that range. Um, did not lose one I mean, night of sleep when we went down to 24. Uh, really just looking for ways to buy even more because it really was selling well below tangible assets. And that's because, again, for our last conversation on the show, this company is undervaluing certain assets, such as their real estate, uh, on their books. So if you were going to bet against this company, you'd have to bet that fossil fuels are done. And that's not true. Uh, we cited a lot of statistics from uh, the IEA last time on our show, uh, on your show. And the fact is, fossil fuels will eventually decline, but not anything like the rate that people think. And seismic exploration has a place for the foreseeable future. You have to understand that this company gets just one more contract, like their satellite contract, which was $170 million. Uh, This stock is going to triple. Nobody knows when another order will come out, but this company has more uh, quotes out than it could possibly fill. I think it's once CapEx continues at the uh, oil majors, <clears throat> and this company is really just one contract away from skyrocketing. So put me on the record saying that uh, I don't know when it will happen, but if you're patient, and investing, as you know, Joel, is a patient business. Even if it took two years, I mean, what if this, what if the company stayed at $28 a share or 26 for the next two years, and then they got one contract? And it would triple. I mean, the stock really would. You'd be talking about a return of 60 or 70 percent a year, even if you had to look stupid for the next two years. In the meantime, there you go. Uh, that's okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, patience not a problem there. No, not at all. Uh, Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson on the line, Chief Investment Officer of Lemelson Capital Management. Uh, you've had a pretty good performance over the last couple of years. It sounds like you're keeping things in line this year as well. So we hope to see you at the top of the ratings again. Uh, before we let you go. Uh, just recap, recap of like the overall market here. Uh, once again, a uh, pretty scary scenario last week. Uh, the rebound even quicker than it was last time on the heels of comments from Janet Yellen. Uh, what are you looking for for the remainder of the year? And uh, could you peek into your crystal ball and tell us what you're looking uh, <laughs> looking at in 2015? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball. I don't have one, unfortunately, Joel. Um, and, you know, I would just say be very careful. The markets are expensive. And when a large earthquake comes, it's usually preceded by a few tremors. Um, just buy stocks that you want to own for a very long time and don't use too much leverage. Or if you can avoid, use le- avoid leverage altogether if you can. There's nothing that's worth losing one night of sleep over. And <clears throat> again, unless you're buying an index fund, um, don't worry too much about what's going to happen in the market. For all I know, Joel, the market will continue to run up for another three months or more, six or a year. Sooner or later, there's going to be a pullback. And if you study the history of markets in the last 100 years, you'll find that these permutations in price, uh, they're becoming more extreme uh, and more condensed. So the space of time between major peaks and troughs is getting shorter. We've had over a five-year run now. Um, what I see when I look at earnings reports, it makes sense. I see a slowdown. I don't see that the... the, the the stimulus is gone, and I don't just mean QE. I mean, really, share buybacks and cheap money is no longer powering stocks for them. There's very few companies, I think, that are out there really outperforming. So uh, be very cautious. Don't use leverage. Just try to find a few truly great businesses that are selling either at a fair price or below a fair price, uh, and be, be patient uh, because it will pay off in the long run. I mean, you're buying a stock, you're buying a productive asset. If you can buy that productive asset for less than its intrinsic value, you're going to do far better over the long run than if you were invested in real estate or some other asset class. So I think those are the things you can know. 
Uh, don't drive yourself crazy over things you can't know, like where the market's going to go tomorrow or next week or something like that. Okay, I just want to let you know we got a nice compliment uh, coming out of the chat room from Sheldon McIntyre, a, a frequent contributor to our show. And he said, based on your demeanor, there is not a calmer money manager than Reverend Emmanuel. Humble and sharp is a powerful combination. So kind words coming from our chat, Reverend. Uh, Thanks again for coming on. It's always uh, great to talk to you, get your insight on the markets and also on global global affairs. Uh, have a, a nice holiday, and uh, we'll check in with you after the new year. Glory be to God, Joel. Thank you for sharing the comments, and thank you for allowing me to be on your show again. Okay. I really appreciate it. Have a Merry Christmas. All right, thank you. The pleasure's ours. Reverend right. Emmanuel Bye -bye. Lemelson, Chief Investment Officer of Lemelson Capital Management.